Hello and welcome to the LND Go Beyond podcast, where we gather workplace learning insights from experts to enable the LND community go beyond. My name is Amit Garg, and this is episode number 21. Today we have a very special guest, the one and only Clark Quinn joining us. <laughs> Hi, Amit and, and everybody. Pleasure to be here. Well, such a such an honor for us, Clark, that you are able to join us. Let me take a moment to introduce Clark, though he really doesn't need any introduction. If you've been in LND, I'm sure you know you've been following his, his work and what he shares on social media. But yeah, if you haven't heard of Clark, Clark provides strategic learning technology solutions to corporates, government, not for profit, and educational organizations. He is an internationally known consultant, speaker, and author of seven books, the seventh one just released. Uh, he integrates a deep understanding of uh, thinking and learning with broad experience in technology to improve organization, organizational execution, innovation, and ultimately performance. Clark was the first guild master, uh, e-learning guilds, first guild master in 2012. So such a, such a pleasure to welcome you on this podcast, Clark. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So the topic that we're going to discuss today, Clark, is uh, moving IED to LXD. That is uh, instructional design to learning experience design. And learning experience design is such a red hot topic. <laughs> you know, you, you get to hear that word so often now. And, you know, maybe I if, if I can get a sense of it, I understand this is also the topic that you are touching in your new book, which is Make It Meaningful, Taking Learning Design from Instructional to Transformational. So do you want to share a little bit of backstory? How did it come about? And you know, what are we really talking about when you say moving ID to LXD, you know, in a nutshell to begin with? Uh, I, I'm not, you've already touched on enough that it's more than a nutshell, but um, <laughs> I, I, my first job out of college, so I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate, design my own major, it's been my career ever since. My first job out of college was designing and programming educational computer games. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to make educational things that were also engaging. Mm -hmm. And that's remained a recurrent theme, games have. And what I've seen missing in so much instructional design is that emotional component. There's only one theorist, and that would be um, John Keller with his ARCS model, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction, who's talked about um, the emotional side of instructional design. So, you know, my first book was on how do you design games for learning? That was trying to mesh uh, engagement and effective education. I found an alignment that uh, in research, I was an academic for a while, and I found research that suggested that there, these elements aligned, um, that what made an effective educational experience also, when you lined it up, also made a most, was the same elements that made engaging experiences. So that's remained a, a, a interest of mine. And I finally, when the phrase came up, learning experiences, and I have to say that I think a lot of the excitement is the new buzz phrase, right? <laughs> the question is, is there any there, there? There are a lot of buzz phrases that I think there isn't. Um, micro learning is one that um, gets me wound around the axle a wee bit. Um, not because there isn't something good there, it's just that there's two entirely different things people talk about. Uh, you know, performance sport and space learning, which one are you talking about when you are talking about it right now? So, there is that frisson of excitement, but I, is there anything underneath? And that's what, to me, there is. And that's that missing emotional component. I think instructional design is all the cognitive stuff. And it talks about how do you, you know, you got to activate the relevant knowledge and you need to present information, but nobody tells you why you should care. And so to me, you know, my most recent book before this one was on uh, learning science. And to me, learning experience design is the elegant integration of learning science with engagement. And you can't, you can just, you know, people do a lot of, oh, let's just tag. Uh, and the reason I didn't use the word engagement in the title, my colleague Charles Jennings suggested, 
engagement's got a lot of uh, baggage with it now. You know, click to see more. That's more engaging. That's just a way to do more content dump, right? Um, or gamification, add points in the scoreboard and it's going to be more engaging. That's trivial. And I'm so I wanted something that talks about a bit more semantically meaningful, emotionally commitment. Um, so those are the elements that I think we're missing. And if we do it right, we can get that. And that's what to me is exciting about the learning experience design is that opportunity to open us up to recognizing the need to hook in the emotions appropriately to the learning experience as well as the cognitive elements. We don't tend to do the cognitive elements well, <laughs> but we do know what it takes there. So I'm trying to lay out what it takes on the other side. Yeah. Very interesting that you said we don't do the cognitive elements well. <laughs> and, you know, I think you mentioned to me uh, earlier when we were coordinating for this podcast about your uh, cheeky assessment <laughs> of L and D, <laughs> you know, and that kind of, you know, uh, sums up where we are and, you know, not everything is fine. <laughs> I think <laughs> the, not even at the cognitive stage, but yes, I think it's a, it's a good uh, way to look at what else can be done. So what I've picked up, uh, you know, from that brief intro, uh, Clark, emotion is one big thing that you are really uh, trying to address when you're saying moving ID to LXD. And also you said it's a combination of learning science and engagement. So are you keeping them, you know, exclusive of each other or it's just that it has happened to become exclusive because we have misunderstood them. You know, initially you said a lot of science education is, you know, education design is similar to engagement design or experience design, right? I think you said something. Mm -hmm. So are you saying these two are separate or maybe in the implementation, they have become separate the way we have implemented it. Um, I think it's the latter. Mm. I think, you know, proper good, when you get real well-trained instructional designers, they get this, but unfortunately too much of instructional design of late has become knowledge dump. And there's a lot of mitigating reasons why this is the case, but you know, we have these tools that make it really easy to take PowerPoints and PDFs and slap them up on the screen and add a quiz and that's learning, right? And it looks like school and we need to do it rapidly. And, you know, we're not measuring what we're doing anyways. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why we're not learning. The cheeky statement you were referring to, you know, when you talk, when this podcast is titled L&D Beyond, um, it's, my statement is L&D isn't doing near what it could and should, and what it is doing, it's doing badly. Other than that is fine. Um, so, you know, the, the beyond is, you know, beginning to account for informal learning, but what we are doing badly is our current learning design. Yeah. And we're not even doing the learning science stuff. Well, we, uh, for all the reasons I mentioned, we tend to have people come up and say, I need a course on this and instructional learners, okay, we'll make a course on that without actually investigating, doing the performance consulting, ensuring that a course is what's needed to solve this problem, you know, not even identifying what the problem is. Yeah. And then they go to the subject matter expert and the subject matter, and they say, what should we do? And then the instructional, does, it turns out the experts don't actually have cognitive access to 70% of what they do. That's the estimate from the cognitive technology group of the University of Southern California. And so that, but they do have access to knowledge. So they recite all the knowledge they think people need and the instructional designers say, okay, we'll put all that in. And they do a bunch of knowledge dump and it could be a bullet points or it can be in a, you know, click to see more, whatever's way to burge large amounts of content. And then we test that knowledge. And there's only one small problem with that. And that is giving people a bunch of new information and expecting them to change how they perform isn't a reasonable expectation. It's based on this model that we're formological reasoning beings. And there's just a lot of evidence we're not. If we were, sure. Oh, this information says to change my behavior, but we're not. Mm -hmm. We you know, look at behavioral economics and um, the work of Daniel Kahneman, you'll see lots of evidence that we are trapped, fall prey to lots of different cognitive traps. In particular, we stick with well-learned behaviors until we learn over it. You can't unlearn, you have to actually learn over the traces. So that's the whole learning science part we're getting wrong. And then when we do try and make it engaging, we add slap up fancy pictures and soundtracks and may add themes. And a lot of these can actually interfere with the learning science. So I don't, um, that's why I say it's the elegant integration. So what I talked about in my book on games, and I talk in this new one as well, is, is how the elements 
of effective education practice and the elements of engaging experience is actually in perfect alignment. If you understand that alignment, you can make experiences that are both engaging and effective. Raph Koster, as a game designer, wrote a book called The Theory of Fun, where he says what makes games fun is learning. And so we can do this, but we have to understand the principles. And so in the learning science book, I didn't include a design process. I was laying out, you know, people already have design processes. I'm talking about the nuances they need to do. In the new book, not only do I talk about, you know, the principles and what the implications are for each of the elements of the learning experience, which I did also in the learning science book, but in this one, I've added design process that includes a reference to the elements from learning science. But then it talks about what do you have to do in addition specifically for this? And I take sort of a generic design process that's pretty close to what everybody does. You know, there's, you know, you could be doing it iteratively, you could be doing a waterfall, but in either case, you still need to get these points and this additional information that you build in addition into your design process. So I, I do think that they, when done properly, they are perfectly integrated. They reinforce each other not that they distract from one another, but you have to understand that alignment to make it work. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So, you know, if, if I were to summarize for myself, learning design itself is something that a lot of learning design folks or learning sciences, they don't understand so much. And engagement is probably the much abused word, which has got <laughs> lost its meaning. You know, like you said, every interactivity is engagement and every badge is an engagement in, in you know, someone's dictionary and I think I think so we've lost our way with you know those terms uh, what you are trying to do with the book itself is bring both of them together including the learning sciences and also saying or telling how do we use it in which stage of the process or how do you modify the process itself excellent indeed excellent. That, that is what I'm trying to do so, uh, you touched upon, you know, a, a point about the experts really not having access to, you know, <laughs> how do they do what they do, right? Uh, and and it, there's obviously a big difference in how you design stuff for experts versus novice learners. And if you go to experts and ask them how to design for novice learners, what you get is essentially knowledge dump, right? That's what. And so we also refer to them as SMEs in in our industry. Uh, is that one of the challenges that instructional designers face that they are essentially going to only SMEs and maybe not novice learners and maybe managers to understand what are the performance objectives, where are people failing, what is good performance looking like, et cetera, and analyzing it before just pushing out content? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, there's several changes that really instructional design needs to go through whether you want to relabel it LXD or not, you know. So the we really need to stop just taking orders for courses and go, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And what evidence do you have that you, you know, that it's not sufficient? What should it be at versus what's it at? How will we know when we fixed it? What will it be at at the end? You know, what does that measure? Mm -hmm. And then make sure what's the root cause of that problem. And when it's a skill or knowledge gap, particularly if it's skill gap, that's when a course makes sense. If it's knowledge gap, it may be better to put the information in the world. Does it have to be in the net or can it be in the world? You know, if it's an incentive gap, a course isn't going to change it. You got to change the rewards for people. So you got to make sure a course is the right answer. You can't really make an engaging experience if you if it's not really addressing the root cause. Then when you've identified a good objective and says, this is what we need people to do differently, then you have to go, well, you have to go to the subject matter experts to say, what would that be? You know, what is that right performance? What does good performance look like? And you can't just take the subject matter experts word for it. Mm -hmm. There are certain subject matter experts, not every subject matter expert who's good at performance can actually articulate this stuff and has good it, it models to communicate them. So uh, and I've worked, talked with a number of people who've done this, you know, a lot and they reinforce this point. And that one of the things to do is potentially getting subject matter experts together and have them negotiate their shared understanding and you just facilitate that process. Mm -hmm. But I think you also want to triangulate with other data. As you said, novice performers, particularly shortly after they've started performing going, this is what they never told me that it was really important. And then their supervisors, 
they see the mistakes that these new people make and know what are the common misconceptions. And see, this is where you start bridging from the learning science to the engagement and that integration, because the real alternatives to the right choices should be the reliable ways people go wrong. Used to be that's a problem to be addressed or to avoid. Now it's an opportunity to help set them straight in the learning experience. And so you know, what you need from subject matter experts now is not just what do they do wrong, but also what are the misconceptions? What are the great stories that they have to tell about big wins and big losses um, that you will build into those examples that will make them compelling? And finally, there's one other way in which subject matter experts are really your, your best friend. <laughs> and that's because they found this topic so interesting. They've spent the years it takes to be a subject matter expert, yeah. as me. Why? What is it that was so fascinating for him? This, I learned this a uh, long time ago. Uh, a colleague, when I was teaching on campus, I was at the University of New South Wales in Australia. And he came to me and said, you do games, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, we're doing one. And I said, he, he, you know, he asked, do you want to help? I said, sure, I'd love to help. What is it about? He said, computer auditing. You know, my eyes rolled back in my head and he said, you know, that's what I thought first. But then I talked to them and they said, it's like playing detective. There's a problem and you work backwards. And uh, some, most of the time, it's just an accident, a mistake. But every once in a while, it's deliberate. And right there, we had the story for the game. You know, you track back and then you find out it's deliberate and you have to find out why. And it turns out the, the this particular bank person is mad at the bank because they fired his mistress. And so, you know, there's a motive for this thing. That's a really engaging story, but you wouldn't know unless you found out why these people find it interesting and you want to bake that in. Then there are, you know, along the way, again, recurrently, there are bunches of additional information, not bunches, just fine nuances. So when you do your audience analysis, it's not just who are they and you know, what do they do, what interests them? What characterizes them from other people that you might use to build in as a theme? Yeah, excellent. And you know what I'm hearing is is uh, something that I also read in Rance Green's book recently hmm. about instructional story design. And you know, so you are bringing stories and emotions, right? And I think they they kind of uh, come together. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> the purpose of stories, if I can, uh, if I understand it right. But what you're saying is emotion is the differentiating factor between IED and LXD as it exists today, because you did refer to saying earlier, good instructional designers may still be able to do it, right? And what we are probably saying is IED here, we are referring to what normally gets done. That in comparison to LXD, the missing piece is emotion. And that needs stories to be brought in, you know, by developing good characters, going into their backgrounds, and what are their real situations on the job, bringing them into those stories? Uh, I'm not, you know, yes, I absolutely believe in story. I think stories are critical, Emma, and I'm not sure they're fundamentally, you know, we do know that invoking emotional experience and so finding, you know, but you might surprise people, curiosity could trigger emotion as well. It's just that stories are well, uh, Oh, well, our cognitive architecture is oriented to comprehend story, and therefore you can minimize the amount of content you have to use because your brain naturally fills things in if it's in the form of stories. It can, you know, you can take a story and ramp up some of the elements to make it more compelling. Mm -hmm. So instead of just working on a patient, you're working on the ambassador's wife or the, the rebel leader who's going to save, you know, your country from the oppressive invaders. There are ways to tune the story and, and stuff, and you can't do it too far, you know. Partly is, you know, you look at TV and movies and books and stuff, they exaggerate life one level beyond what's familiar, because if you go too far, you, you know, you get that suspension of disbelief. But, and then even then you're going to have to tune it. That's another part of this. You can't assume you're going to get it right. You build the first prototype or test, you know, your practices first and then test everything. But that's part of working with humans and stuff. And yes, the, the important point of emotion is that when our emotions are engaged appropriately, mm -hmm. the learning sticks better. Now you can probably interfere with that if you have too much negative emotion. Uh, there was a theorist, Masaro, who talks about transformational learning and he talks, you know, and so I have to be careful when I say transformational because 
he talks about things that change people's lives, but that's after the death of a loved one. And frankly, I don't want to go to those lengths as a learning designer, right? I'm not into murder or any of those things. But so how do you make smaller changes? But you you, you do need to get them emotionally engaged and that will lead to, to learning. And so, you, and I think a little negative can be challenging. You probably want to start positive and gradually move them to negative. I, when I talk about you know, if you need them to perform under stress, eventually you will have to have them practice in stressful situations. But first let them master the skills without stress. And then when they start feeling confident that they can do it, then you gradually ramp up the stress levels until they're performing in the environment like they'll have to perform in, in the non-learning environment, in the workplace environment. And then you feel confident that they're prepared. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point, and I'll come back to that. You know, practicing under uh, uh, stress, but coming to the emotion part, you know, do you see the corporate environment is little averse to anything which has an emotional component, and that's why some of this doesn't happen. Even if there are well-meaning instructional designers, they'll get pushed that you know, let's do it in a straighter manner. Let's not you know go around and develop all of this, etc. I do believe there's elements of that. Um, management can think, oh, if we allow emotion and it could be open Pandora's box and suddenly we're gonna have uh, everybody wanting to have parties and stuff, you know, don't be silly. Um, and experts can go, oh, you can't treat this without the greatest of seriousness. And, but talk to the audiences. Mm -hmm. They will much prefer an engaging experience to a non-engaging one. Mm -hmm. And my advice, you know, I think, I'm increasingly finding that for anything, you know, how do you deal with people who believe in this? How do you try and make organizational change? How do you do these sorts of things? Have, be prepared with a variety of angles to deal with this. So one is to say, let's talk to the audience, see what they want. Mm -hmm. Let's um, do a pilot and test it. Let's show the evidence that uh, more success, you know, more engaging experiences are more successful for learning. Also, um, it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Do it. And design way further than you think you'll get away with because they will rein you in. But um, where they rein you in is probably where you expected to go anyways. But if you start only where you think they'll let you go, well, they'll still rein you in and you'll be much less engaging than you could be if you really push the boundaries first and force them to rein you in. And so it's a combination of, you know, uh, stealth and uh, frontal attack and <laughs> everything <laughs> and figure out, you know, and you may have to try more than one. Um, people, it takes time sometimes to convince them of this. It helps if you have examples to show them, ask them about their own learning experiences. You know, what did you prefer? Did you prefer that di dry didactic presentation or did you prefer the more engaging practice oriented, you know, <laughs> And different ones may work with different people. That's why I suggest having, you know, a full suite to hand to try and do that convincing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that convincing is a, is a big part. Absolutely. You, you talk, talked about, you know, uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, I think, very briefly. Mm -hmm. And I think that becomes very important where unless people care for something, you know, if if they don't, then it's very difficult for them to really invest time and energy into learning. And that's the emotion bit, right? Whether you get it through like, you know, a story or through a suspense or curiosity, anything, but unless they care about it, uh, you know, we can't do much uh, to really pull them in and uh, spend energy. I agree. And in fact, I think that's a very interesting statement because I actually break it into sort of two parts. And I use a fishing metaphor, and I'm not a fishing person, so I probably buggered up. But um, the the first part is you got to hook them. Mm -hmm. You got to get this emotional, as you say, exactly. They have to believe it's important. They have to believe it's relevant to them. They have to see the with them, the what's in it for me. And I think you know what I want is emotional reaction as a consequence. And I believe you have to open up emotionally, but even before you do it cognitively, because otherwise, yeah. as you say, if they're not, if they don't believe it's important, you may as well just send them off because everything you do is not going to stick. And then, you know, yeah. and so you've just wasted the energy doing it. So I want a reaction that says, you know, I do need this. And 
two, sometimes you may need a second component to that, and I don't know it. Because mm -hmm. if they think they, you know, I know I need this, but I believe I can do it. And I've literally seen situations where we had salespeople who thought they were great salespeople, and we had to break that down and show them that they weren't mm -hmm. before they were really willing to learn. And then you need a one third, a third component, which is, and this experience will address that. You have to, they have to trust you. And I suspect that a lot of our learning departments right now don't have that trust because what they've done and they have to re-earn it. So they may have to uh, go a bit overboard to really, you know, they may have to entreat people. They may have to say, please give us the benefit of the doubt. We've changed, here's a sample, whatever it is, you know. And, and then you have to deliver on that promise, of course. So after you hook them, so if you can get that commitment, and I believe you show them the whiff them, you show them the consequences of having that knowledge positively or the negative consequences of not having that knowledge, you can do it dramatically or humorously. Um, and there's some great examples of that. And then you have to deliver. So once you've hooked them, you've got the commitment to go through the learning experience, then you have to deliver. You have to have the practice have a level of challenge that's appropriate for where they are and it's got to gradually build. And you've got to have, as you pointed out, good story. And Rance Green is referred to in, in, in my book, his instructional to story design, I uh, read it. And um, so you need to lead them through the experience with just the minimum amount of content and the right practice that's set in a meaningful story and it's at the right level of challenge. And if you continue that experience, continually increasing their ability. And we don't think enough about their emotional trajectory through the learning mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. You wanna keep the anxiety low enough that it doesn't interfere with learning. Some anxiety actually leads to performance, but just learning things can be anxiety inducing enough, right? So you wanna explicitly consider that. And what is their confidence doing? Are you gradually building their confidence in this? And their motivation, are you sure you're maintaining it? You know, it might jump high once you've got them convinced, but it could drop if you don't deliver. So if we ex explicitly think about those emotional trajectories as we're thinking about the experience, and that's another thing I like about the addition of experience into the um, phrase learning experience design, it integrates learning and experience, and we're designing to achieve a learning experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, uh, learning science tells us that can't be just a one-off an event. It really has to be an extended thing. And so we need to factor that into our design of the learning experience. But if we develop and maintain that emotional component throughout the learning experience, it's going to be more effective. Yep. And really people can come out at the end and go, whoa, and when I, you know, when I talk about from instructional to transformational, I really want them to go, whoa, I, and you need to do this deliberately, help them recognize they are now newly capable. They have now had an experience that was engaging and effective and that they come out and they go, I'm now capable of something new. I've been transformed when we're on our game. Uh, a really interesting side note, and sorry, I'm, I'm nattering mm -hmm. on too much, but Pine and Gilmore wrote a book called The Experience Economy. Mm -hmm. And what they argued is we've gone from, you know, agricultural to product to service economies. And they argued we were in a uh, experience economy where we pay for experiences. So we go to themed restaurants and we go to themed parks and things. But what intrigued me was not that, but what they said was the next economy that was going to be coming. And they called that the transformation economy. We would pay for experiences at transformers. And that, what excited me about that is when we're on our game, that's what we do. We are, arguably the best suited to be the deliverers of that next economy. And that to me is what's so exciting about this opportunity to really master that elegant integration. So we can deliver transformative experiences and we can become the drivers of the next economy and even you know, just the greater success of our organizations. There's so much uh, in there lot to unpack, but let me just try and bring in a few uh, thoughts together. So you started off and, you know, I think that's very right. l &D has probably lost a bit of its brand and they need to re-earn that. So if today anybody has to be told you have to do another program, chances are, <laughs> correct, chances are they will do that. 
and which is a reflection, you know. So there is learner pushback coming in and fatigue with learning, et cetera, et cetera. And there is this promise of what l &D can do as organizations try and, you know, get themselves into transformational experiences for their customers as well as people, right? All of this, uh, the great resignation or a great rethink that is happening probably has an indication of some of that. And l &D is really truly, well and truly uh, having the spotlight. And that brings me to the comment that I think uh, Brandon Carson made recently. And I think he's written a book where he's captured it. Learning is the new strategy, right? And maybe, you know, it is also indicating of that, that learning is getting that spotlight. People who are able to grab it and transform themselves first at their game, they would be able to deliver this transformational experience uh, that, that you are talking of. Yeah, I, I might do a separation. So when I say l and isn't doing near what it could and should and what it is doing, it's doing badly. The What it is doing is typically helping organizations execute on the things they know they need to do. It's about optimal execution. Mm -hmm. And this, the part of where they're not doing near what they could and should, first it's adding performance support. Sometimes that's a far better solution than a course, putting knowledge in the world instead of head, but that's still optimal execution. And I think the real opportunity for l and and this um, it excites me, this is one of the th reasons I think this field has such potential is Optimal execution is only going to be the cost of entry going forward. As things are increasingly dealing with, you know, VUCA, volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous environments, we're going to need to keep learning. But that's a learning that's not formal learning because there isn't anybody with the answer for us. We're going to have to discover it. So that's informal learning. And I think, you know, organizations are doing that. The question is who should be responsible for facilitating that? And I believe L&D should because they're supposed to know the most about learning. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of accidental instructional designers and people who are uh, responsible for designing learning who don't necessarily understand the learning science behind it. But if you do, not only can you better design formal learning, but you can also understand about facilitating informal learning. And therefore, I think L&D should be the one in that. And to me, that's why learning is the strategy. I think that's what Brandon's saying is it's going to be both the formal learning to optimize our execution, but the informal learning, which frankly, the Make It Meaningful book isn't about. Um, it's trying to make our formal, you know, uh, formal learning more effective. Um, you know, the revolutionized learning development uh, uh, several books ago was really about that bigger picture, which I believe strongly in. I just realized um, one thing I could contribute was this focus on the emotional side. And I wanted to make that contribution too, just because, you know, when I say the elegant integration of learning science and, and uh, engagement, there are increasing numbers of books about learning science, you know, including mine, but um, the, the rate at which they're appearing has increased, which makes me think we're getting, uh, finally recognizing the importance of getting that right. But then I went and looked and said, what is there to help us on the engagement size? And I didn't feel like there was as much that with, you know, there's gamification stuff. Um, there are, you know, people like Carl Kopp talk about game design and, and some of this, but I wanted to try and make it practical in terms of what should a learning designer do? What do they need to know? And what should they do in their design process that led me to, to decide to write that most recent book? Fantastic. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, I had a chance to speak with Carl uh, a few episodes ago. And one of the things that I really like about what he draws parallel between principles of gamification and principles of engagement, and they are pretty much the same. You know, for learning engagement and gamification, they're pretty much the same. It's just that you know we get confused. And my understanding is, and I think you refer to that, and I'll come to that practice part. When when you say they are on a journey they are gradually moving up. We are controlling the levels of anxiety. We are keeping their emotion in check. What you are essentially doing is building a gamified structure without calling it gamified. It's a journey that you've created where they are improving gradually. They are maybe moving up levels. Even if you don't call it levels, they are feeling confident that enthusiasm or the feeling of flow, if they can you know, somehow get, 
even to some extent, you are essentially designing a gamified solution without really explicit badges and all of those things. Do you see a similarity between that? Um, yes, and. Um, so Carl was kind enough to write the introduction for my book. And so, uh, you know, he's aware of what I'm doing. And he's also aware that I have a real problem with the term gamification because it, like engagement, it has been subverted to mean adding right. points and scoreboards and then we're done, right? And no, and you know, I've talked this about Carl and he distinguishes between serious games and gamification. Yeah. And I strongly believe in serious games and the elements to talk about putting people in a meaningful context. Uh, Michael Allen talks about uh, context, challenge, activity and feedback. And I, it's about making practice a really appropriately challenging contextualized thing. And that's what Raf Koster was talking about, his theory of fun. So yes, it is about trying to turn learning into a serious game, but it's not about the tricks and bells and whistles. Right. It's about building an intrinsic. And so I, I, I worry, and I, that's why I hesitate to use the term gamification because I think it brings in all the baggage the same way engagement does. So I try and talk about, well, uh, motivation, and I also believe uh, DC and Ryan's self-determination theory provides good guidance about motivation, about autonomy and challenge. You know, competence is really about the level of challenge and autonomy is about being able to make choices on your own instead of just being given information and told what to do. You have to go into a situation and actually make your choices and live with the context or consequences and feedback from that. So I, I, I to the extent that gamification means, you know, the, the, the right stuff, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. I just want to make be very clear about this isn't just about tarting it up with ancillary stuff. It's about really making it intrinsically um, aligned. Absolutely. And I think <laughs> on the podcast, I think he said uh, PBLs are the evil uh, trio <laughs> that we have P for PBL point. point and and just and boards <laughs> are the evil ones. Uh, so yeah, if you can do gamification without them, and that's exactly what I was seeing a parallel in, if you can call them loops of practice, you know, which you were talking about. So, you know, when you say uh, practicing under stress, but before that, can they practice without stress? And then we bring practice some stress. So essentially you're saying in the first loop, maybe they are practicing with some support. Then the support is gradually being removed. So they become more confident about their capabilities. And then you keep adding, you know, as you go along. And that's, in my view, real gamification. Points, badges, and leaderboards are, you know, really the bells and whistles. It may may suit sometimes, it may not most of the times, but yeah. Well, and, you know, Clark Aldridge told me the story about building his leadership game. He, you know, was a Gartner analyst and he really, believed in games and he's continued with a short sims approach now but he created this leadership game and um he admitted that at the end of the day he'd been building in the intrinsic and he finally added points at the end because his investors were saying you've got to get this on the market you can't keep tuning it <laughs> to add some, you know so he just threw in points to add up to add some additional stuff and i, yeah. I get that and i live in the real world and you know transformational is an asp aspirational goal right? That would be ideal. But if we try to achieve that, we're going to do far better than if we just go, oh, well, we're going to do a content dump and it's all good, right? Um, no, we have to do better than that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, Clark, I mean, the way I see it, you know, and people who will be listening to this, uh, they would get a sense that there's a lot more that needs to be done to make really transformational learning. And compared to what they currently do, it just seems a lot more in terms of, you know, connecting with uh, SMEs at a different level and gathering a lot more information, possibly creating personas and stories and, you know, maybe doing few iterations before you get it right, etc. And it may seem like a lot of cost for both in times and actual cost. But I also go by what Michael Allen writes in his book that any learning that is not effective is actually waste. So if you're wasting maybe $100 today and <laughs> you end up spending $500 in creating something better, that $500 is better than the $100 that you wasted. So do you see that cost or time challenge coming in as you think of, you know, ID getting transformed to LXD? Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And th that was my point about, you know, totally doing it the right way is aspirational, but making steps along the way to get there is really important. As you point out, absolutely. It's waste if you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And we are throwing courses at, in, in now, but there are a number of factors I think that help reduce the, this as an issue. One is that we're throwing courses at situations where courses aren't the best solution. Uh, Guy Wallace likes to quote Joe Harless, who said, famously said, inside every bloated training course is a thin job aid struggling to get out. There are lots of times when a job aid would be a far more cost effective and effective solution than a course. Right. So we need to, and so we need to do some more upfront work to make sure a course is a solution. That's going to save our resources. So we'll have more to dedicate to the times when courses really are the best solution. And we can start making small changes. There's not a lot of additional information needed. There's just some small nuances around it. You know, it's you're going to have to talk to the subject matter expert, but if you go in with a template and remember all the things you have to ask, you're going to get it done in about the same amount of time and you're going to have a better focus when doing it. So instead of just going, what should they know? You're going, okay, what are the models? What are the misconceptions? What are the stories we need to hear? Why did you like this? Why have you spent so much time? Okay, I can take that in. Then focus on the practice first. That's the most important thing we do wrong. We do 80% of content and 20% of practice. We've got to reverse that. So part building more practice, focus on that. Then only build the minimum content it takes to succeed. And, you know, Kathy Moore in her map, it talks about this, you know, focus rapidly on the performance and then bring in the additional content when you need it. That sort of switch in focus. And here's the, 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 the carrot to go along with the stick. Creating engaging practice is a creative process. It's fun <laughs> when you're doing it right. Yes, you have some you know, pressure to do it, but with practice, you get better at it. And with practice and feedback, just like we do, we want for our learners to get practice and feedback because we do practice and feedback, we'll get better at it. And once it becomes a habit, it becomes much easier. So it, it's small transfer, you know, I recognize nobody's gonna throw out their design process and bring in a whole new one. So that's why I tried to say, what's a generic process and what are the small changes along the way you need? Develop a practice and everybody's talking about more iterative versions. So, you know, whether it's uh, Megan Torrance with her llama or Michael Allen with his Sam, people are beginning to recognize we need to prototype, test it, refine it. That's part of this as well, but it's all fitting together. It's all about improving the learning outcomes. So we are not wasting money and we are achieving outcomes that we aren't now. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, yes, you know, some of these processes have come a long way that people are playing with that for many years. You know, Michael Allen's process has been around for more than a decade now, you know. Uh, yeah, and you talked about CCAF earlier and I think that's a great example of how to put performance up front, you know, in almost all of the things that they show in their on their website or on, on, the, on the in the book. Everything is really performance up front. And that I think it builds a lot of relevance and motivation for the learners as they get into a program. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So uh, I think you know this is a good uh, reassuring uh, part of what you just said about how to go about it, because it can seem a little daunting to a lot of people. Uh, if I can bring up, you know, uh, there is there is a recent research by Fosway Group about, uh, you know, there's a lot of learner pushback, there's uh, digital learning fatigue that have set in. And I think I have known about learner pushback for a few years now. Maybe it got accelerated in the pandemic because everything was made digital, like you said, in a hurry without thinking. Uh, and learning leaders are now thinking of learning experience to be a focus area to counter that. Seems like a good direction that they're taking. Uh, what do they need to really back it up with? You know, intention looks like the research is pointing out that it is in the right direction. But what else do they need to really back, back it? I think they need to, you know, they need to understand some of the learning reasons why. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, learning science includes that emotional component. And in my learning science book, I did have a section on the emotional component. But, so recognize that 
and, and leverage that. I think they also need to, to recognize that learning experiences are really for novices to get to the practitioner level where they feel confident enough that they're willing to try this outside. The learning in the workflow where increasingly, you know, the person, you know, the learner pushback is a lot because I'm here right now. I don't want to take a course. I just need the answer. That's absolutely legitimate. When they're now practitioners, they know what they need to know. They know why it's important. Because novices don't know what they need to know. They don't know what's important. That's when a learning experience makes sense. Stop creating learning experiences for practitioners. Start doing workflow learning and bringing in performance support in the moment, not putting it in the head. And, you know, the experts need to be interacting with other experts. They don't need courses. You know, now they may be an expert in X and they've just been, you know, they've been the best performer on the, on the line, they're an expert in that, but now they've been made a manager, they're a novice manager. Maybe a learning experience makes sense for them. And to start thinking about distributing, it's not just about an event. You need to start thinking about what little bit can I do now? And then how can I reinforce that? What is the role of coaching in a learning experience? What is the role of stretch assignments in a learning experience? It's going beyond the event model. So, um, so what do they need? They need to have an understanding of learnings. You know, we. It's a sad state of affairs that far too many people who are in our industry don't understand learning, don't have the foundation. And it's not that you use it all the time, but when you, for the most important decisions you make, that's, it probably plays a role. Um, it, the, the, so they need to know when it's the right solution and not to use it inappropriately. They need to know um, how to manage it, uh, how to, that people, there needs to be collaboration at certain points. I went and did some consulting with an organization and they had, you know, this design process that was pretty much handoff. And I said, no, important, you know, I don't expect you to have teams working all the way along. That's desirable. It's not pragmatic, but at certain points you need to bring in people together for a meeting and share the ideas and brainstorm and work together to get the best outputs. Because when we bring in more brains at certain points, the output's better. And then we can execute against that thing until it gets to the next critical stage. So you need to start understanding what makes design processes work and then how do we fine tune our process to make that, to bring in those critical elements at the right time without blowing out our budget. Um, and so that's sort of internal and then external is the ability to articulate that, um, say, Look, we're shifting. We're not going to throw a course at everything because it doesn't work. We're going to. We want to start measuring with you, so we're making sure we're not just throwing money at a problem and having no idea whether it sticks. We want to make sure that it's solving your problem. And so there's, it, it's a shift in mentality that says we are now not about learning. We are about performance. Mm -hmm. We are about making our learning lead to better performance. We're about supporting performance in any way that facilitates performance. And I think, it, you know, and we wanna be able to talk to the CFO and justify our existence and not just have it, everybody know that we're a cost center. We wanna show the benefit we're giving to the org. It's, it's, it's scary. You know, it means we have to get out of our silos. Yeah. It means we have to stop doing just what we've been comfortable doing. And, you know, I think, I, I say this flipply and somebody pointed out that people could take offense. So don't take offense at it, but we're a faith-based industry. If we build it, it is good. You know, um, it looks like school, so it must be effective. We've got to stop that. We've got to start checking ourselves. I think the most important thing we need to do is start measuring because then we'll find out if what we're in and not our efficiency. We do measure, we measure smile sheets, which has zero correlation with the impact 0 0.09, which is zero with around here. <laughs> uh, um, you know, we measure how many, uh, people we serve per you know L and D employee and stuff like that. That's all efficiency measure. Mm -hmm. We don't know if that person helping that many people is making any change in the organization until we measure that. We don't know, and then we have to start practicing internally some of these our own practices about collaboration and sharing mistakes, so nobody else makes the same mistakes. Learning out loud um, and collaboration at the right places. So we own it, we know it, we can bring it forward to the rest of the organization. Excellent points. Excellent points, you know, but, but I, think, I think it's a good advice to learning leaders who are looking at, you know, considering learning experience design. And it is not just the intention, there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, 
Absolutely. And I think the point on measuring efficiency is, is something that uh, LND seems to be very good at. We've been measuring efficiency all along, but effectiveness is one thing that you know is, is very difficult for most teams to measure. Well, it, it's increasingly easy. So it's conversation. They have metrics that they should be using to decide that they need a course. They should be working with you to get that. And you should both be tracking to see whether it's impacting. We have greater tools. Experience API starts giving us the ability to track all sorts of different activities and correlate that and look for evidence that what we're doing has led to a change. And you know, sometimes it's humans, but we haven't gone and looked and said, has our course led to any change in behavior in the workplace? We can start asking managers, you know, and we need to, by the way, involve managers in this process because if they aren't supporting it, it's going to exterminate. Even if they come out all, even if the learners come all fired up at the end of the course, I'm going to do this. With the manager's indifferent, it's going to fall away. Yep. So we need to invoke, involve them in the learning experience. Uh, a lady I know who worked for a big pharma company said, we don't build a course until we don't release a course until we've also built the manager training to go with it. Mm -hmm. I think that was really insightful. And so, you know, and then they can be reporting back on some of this data. It is leading to the change in the workplace and they can be collecting some of the data about the changes and bringing that back. But it's, again, getting out of the silo <laughs> and beginning <laughs> to interact with others, becoming part of the organization, not a... a not an appendix, but an integral part. Oh, very valuable advice. Fantastic. Clark, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. I've learned so much. Anything else that you would want to add before we close this one? Especially for, let's say, the accidental instructor designers that you referred to, if they want to move to LXD. Um, I think the first... You know, the first and most important thing for anybody in L&D, and that includes the accidental instructional planner, is find out about learning science. Yeah. And it, it can, you know, speaking of feeling overwhelmed, you know, all the stuff to do the emotion, it, it's overwhelming. It's really not. And the same thing with the learning science. There's fun, you know, there's a fundamental core human information processing cycle, which includes attention and short-term memory and how things get into long-term memory and then how we retrieve them. If you understand that, you really... You have to understand it and it's not complex. You know, everybody gets all excited about neuroscience and brain-based learning and all stuff. It, it, forget it. Most of the stuff is at the cognitive level and at core, there's a pretty simple cycle and a few important emergent properties from that architecture. If you get your mind around, you're gonna be able to make much better decisions. It's not that complex. You don't have to, you know, that's what I did in my learning science book, but that's not the only way to do it. There are a number of ways to do it. It's more important that you do it than how you do it. Um, I don't care if there's, you know, you watch a video, you take a course, um, you read a book, but make sure you understand that. And if you get that, a lot of this stuff is just gonna fall out of that understanding. And we go, oh, well, that's, of course we have to do that. No wonder. Um, and so that's uh, my plea to the actual instructional designer is, is just get that professional underpinning for your for your the role you're in, so that you can do it in the way that it needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, I, I read the you know your book on uh, myths and <laughs> uh, misconceptions, and uh, I, I thought for instructional designers who have been in the domain but don't understand a lot of learning science, that could be a great book to start with because it's, it's capturing the bits of wrong that we have been doing, and it could be a great primer to get started and can possibly drive curiosity about learning so much more because it just encapsulates everything into one place. I mean, it's just wonderful. <laughs> so for anybody who's, who's, who wants to get started, I would think that's the best book to get started because it will shake you up if you've been you know, believing wrong things, all the myths, and that can possibly drive you to start looking for the right things. It does cover a number of the ways in which we go wrong and some of the beliefs we have. So thank you. I appreciate that uh, recommendation. Um, uh, and I'm glad if it serves in that way. Um, I, <laughs> I, I hadn't thought of it that way and, and I'm, I don't disagree. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, because unless we challenge, like you've been saying about any learning experience to be designed, 
but unless we challenge the current thinking, the curiosity about knowing the new stuff may not be there. And I think it can challenge uh, a lot of people's uh, <laughs> conceptions. <laughs> this is an excellent one. I appreciate it. Fantastic. Clark, thank you so much once again. It's been such an honor and what an insightful conversation. I really loved it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, I mean, I It was fun. I, thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. My pleasure. <laughs>